Yeah, yeah. <laughs> DNA replication. A little bit more into detail about what I've been talking about when I say DNA synthesis, DNA synthesis, S phase of the cell cycle. <laughs> this apparently is, I don't know if that's an ideogram or a karyogram of your genes. Levi's. Pardon? They look like Levi's. They look like Levi's. Well, there were some metacentrics, and acrocentrics, and telocentrics. So for next class, there's going to be videos to watch again before class, but I didn't want to spam you over the weekend with requests to watch videos for today. So there wasn't nothing to watch for today, just to read. And we're going to start with Watson and Crick and the double helix. And this is one of the most famous quotes from their paper, goodness, almost 70 years ago where they published the structure of DNA, which is, of course, what this class is all about. Genetics. We're talking about DNA. What do they mean? Who can explain or interpret this quote? Give us a little bit more detail. What's the specific pairing they're talking about? Which is A's pair with T's and C's pair with G's, Chargaff's rule. So what does that have to do with how DNA is copied or replicated? Does it make it easier for the enzymes to uh, attach whatever they would need? Well, think about PCR. What ha what's the first step in PCR? Right, you have a double-stranded molecule of DNA. You denature it. <laughs> What's the next step in PCR? Anneal. You anneal what? Primers. Primers. And then extension. So you've already seen DNA replication. What's the enzyme that does the extension phase? <coughs> DNA, <coughs> DNA polymerase. And how does it know? So let me draw in some base pairs here, just a random sequence. How does DNA polymerase sitting right here know what nucleotide to add next? Right here. What's it going to put in there? A C, because that pairs with G. That's what Watson and Crick meant. This is way before anybody knew anything about the enzymes or primers or PCR or anything. They just said, this is the structure of DNA. We see the adenines pair with thymines and guanines pair with cytosines. That suggests a possible copying mechanism. That if you take a double helix and you split it in half, if you denature it, then how does that help us? Make two copies of the same piece of DNA. Each strand gives us the information, as we learned from Shargaff's rule, about what the nucleotides are going to be on the opposite strand. But before we got there, there was another famous experiment that proved, this is the Messelson-Stahl experiment. You don't have to remember the names. Now, I've told you their names once, so you've heard it before. You don't have to memorize it. The Messelson-Stahl experiment was the experiment that proved how DNA double helices are replicated. So that's the main take home for today, is to be able not only to understand how their experiment worked, but also to maybe apply it in new situations to really understand the basis for the experiment. And then to look at the molecular details of DNA replication. So that's where we're headed. Any questions at this point before we head in? Okay. So you've Hopefully, if you read the, ch the chapter or if you've taken high school biology or anything like that, you've seen a figure like this before, maybe. So we've got a double helix up here at the top. These on the left side and the right side are two different ways that DNA synthesis was thought could occur. So one of these two is true, one of them is not. And that's one of the questions on your Socratic exam. Oh, actually. I took that question out. Never mind. <laughs> Sorry, you're not, taking, you're not taking the wrong Socratic quiz. It's OK. So what's the difference between these two models? The conservative model on the left, semi-conservative on the right. Even if you don't know the details, just what's, what do you see that's different? Uh, 
And yeah. then the read model, the first, the DNA um, replication, and you have one part in the first round of replication, one is going to be the complete copy of it, and the other one is going to be, no, okay. yes. And then on the other, the yep. letter B, yep. you're going to have one strand of DNA of the original, and the other strand is the copy, so you have both. Right. Half, 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 half original, half new. So the conservative model says you take a double helix. By the way, first question down here at the bottom. Why are the chromosomes colored differently? This is an important detail about Mendelssohn-Stahl's experiment. <laughs> so they, yes, yeah, so you want to know which are the original strands of DNA and which ones are the newly synthesized strands of DNA. So that's the dark color are the original strands. And the light strands down here are the new strands, or the newly synthesized strands. How did Messelson and Stahl actually, they didn't color double helices marker. What did they use to distinguish the parental strands from the new strands, or the original strands from the new strands? Yeah, so it has to be something chemical because we're talking about a deoxyribonucleic acid molecule. The original molecules, these were back, they studied this in bacteria. They grew the bacteria in heavy nitrogen, which is heavy, so hence darker color. Darker color, heavy nitrogen. Am I right so far? N15? Ends normally 14. Thank goodness for the table, it's a periodic table of the elements. So they used heavy nitrogen. They grew the bacteria in heavy nitrogen, so all of their DNA in these bacteria were all heavier than they normally would be. They had nitrogen 15, not nitrogen 14. Those are the dark colored strands up there. And this is a type of an experiment called a pulse chase experiment. The pulse is you grow organisms in one sort of medium, like heavy nitrogen. And then you take those organisms out of the label, the pulse, so you pulse label with N15. And then there's a period of time where you chase, and all that means is that you put them back in normal medium, as normal nitrogen, N14. So that from that point forward, when you take the bacteria out of the heavy nitrogen, you put them in normal medium, and 14, then all of the new DNA that gets synthesized after that point incorporates the lighter version of nitrogen. So up until this point in time, all of the molecules, all of the strands are dark because the bacteria have been growing in N15. And then in this first generation, What's the difference? We already heard the difference. We have, in conservative replication, you have one double helix. It's like you stuck it in a copy machine. You put that original double-stranded molecule of DNA in. You get out the original double helix. Both strands are heavy. And you get one double helix where the double helix has been totally synthesized anew from scratch. And that's the key difference between that and the semi-conservative, half-conservative, denature the molecule in each of those two strands, the two dark strands here, there, and there, serve as templates for building the other strand of DNA. So a second question down there at the bottom. What happens if you take those <coughs> molecules of DNA that are produced by the second round of cell division and you centrifuge them? Centrifuging separates molecules by weight, mass. So N15 molecules are going to go farther down the centrifuge tube. Don't confuse this with gel electrophoresis. Similar principle, but heavy, here, draw, make a little test tube on your slide for both of those two models and draw out the patterns of bands that you'd expect from those molecules of DNA. Are you going to centrifuge all eight in the same one? Or all four. So it's either, the th it's either the four on the left circled in black Yep, so two tubes. You combine all four of those. So what are the different patterns you're going to get?
How many different bands are there going to be on the left side? How many different sets of nucleic acids? Two. Two. Okay, one is totally heavy, heavy, two heavy strands, two dark molecules. So that's going to go down there to the bottom of the tube. And then the other type is we've got three molecules of all light. So they're going to be higher up in the centrifuge tube. And this is how Messelson and Stahl could distinguish these two possibilities, is that the pattern, hopefully you've gotten to the pattern on the right, how does it differ? What's the difference between the left side and the right side? You only have one original Instead of both of those two original strands being part of the same molecule and being an all-heavy band, you've got the half-heavy bands, except I can't spell, half-heavy, and then two of those, and then you've got two molecules that are light. Yeah. Doesn't, I mean, I feel like the semi-conservative model would make sense, um, because if, if polymerase is gonna, you know, you denature your, your DNA, and then polymerase comes in and it attaches. Yep, so but they know, didn't know that at the time. So now it's. Now it makes sense. When I, when I taught this class last semester, I tried to explain, because I always start class with, as we know, semi-conservative replication is what happens. You melt the two strands, and then DNA polymerase uses each strand as a template to build the other strand. I can't even come up with, and maybe one of you can help me, I can't come up with how to explain how this would happen. How, you'd take, how, how would you have an enzyme that would take a whole double helix and spit out an original and a total copy? Unless it involved more denaturation right at the end. I, but that would still not be replication. You'd have to denature and reassemble them differently. Right. It seems like you use it like, like, a, like a copy machine, you know, where you make a copy of something. Yeah. And then you still have your original copy, but you have the, this new one. So that could have been just an alternative. Like, I, so I think I said copy machine actually today, didn't I? So you could imagine an enzyme that has a big hole in it. You feed in a double helix. It reads the double helix and it synthesizes a new double helix. That was what they were trying to distinguish here. And it turns out, so N15 double helix will wind up at the bottom of a centrifuge tube if the top's up here and the centrifugal force is down. N15 molecules will go down to the bottom of the tube. The lighter N14 would float a little bit more. They won't get pushed as far down the centrifuge tube. So N15, I guess I should use some sort of color coding. That would be dark molecules, all light, so that's all heavy. What happens to those intermediate molecules? That should be pretty straightforward. What happens if you have a molecule that's, as was predicted in some of those, one light strand, one heavy strand? It's in between. So there's a possibility of getting three distinct regions of this liquid in the centrifuge tube, liquid in the centrifuge tube. And we're going to find out, based on whether or not conservative or semi-conservative replication happens, what the pattern of bands in this tube is. Yeah. Um, if, we, if we talk about DNA replication, if... We are talking about yeah. DNA replication. Um, yeah? If you replicate DNA, it's supposed to be the same. You're using the same one from... That it's the same copy, like a daughter should be the same as the first one. Why then it would be light or heavy? Same nucleotide sequence, different nitrogen atoms. So the nucleotides are the same. A's, T's, G's, and C's, the sequence is the same. The only difference is that, and this is the reason that they use nitrogen instead of, well, carbon would have been useful too. I was trying to think of an element that's not in a nucleotide. The point is that nitrogen is in nucleic acids, <laughs> nitrogenous base. So it was an element they could use that would label every one of the four different bases, A's, T's, G's, and C's, and would let them track which one was an old or pulse-labeled strand and which strand was a new or light strand. So the sequence of the bases doesn't differ. The only difference is here black has N15, and the blue strands are containing light versions of nitrogen. Sequence of the two strands is the same. 
in all of these cases. That this is what Misselson and Stahl saw. That the actual figure from their publication so many years ago, 1958, they had cameras back then? So here's what it looks like. We've got on the right there the three molecular weights of the bands, light at the top, then half heavy, then heavy at the bottom. So they're not spread out as far as they were in my drawings. But you can see there are three different series of bands. The weird thing about this is that time's going from right to left. So each of these strips is they, they waited a certain period of time with their bacteria growing in their tissue or their culture flasks. They'd pull a little bit out. And then they'd look at the molecular weights of the DNA. And they'd wait a little bit longer. So this first reading was at 0.3 generations. So their unit of time is how many times have the bacteria replicated or divided. So here's the, after the first generation of bacterial growth. What's the only band there? All, all of the DNA is half heavy after one generation. And after two generations, 1.9 generations, I'm being generous and rounding here at the top, two generations. Half of the strands are heavy, light, and half of the strands are half heavy. So what's the overall pattern? What's happening as generation proceeds this direction? It's semi-conservative replication. But what's, how would you describe this pattern of bands? You're getting more and more N14 or light DNA, which is not surprising because you only fed those bacteria N15 for a short little period of time. So you give them a tiny bit of heavy nitrogen. And as time proceeds, what happens to that heavy nitrogen? N15. It's getting diluted. Every generation that DNA synthesis occurs again, you're incorporating more N14 into all of the DNA and all of these bacteria you're growing. What happens to the N15, the heavy nitrogen that was originally there? Is it still there in the fourth generation? It's there. It's just it's there. there. Yeah. 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 Right, so it's, there's still a half heavy band there. It's just really light compared to all of the new DNA that's been synthesized, that light band, this super thick, dark band up there. So what happens eventually? The bottom question. After generations equals infinity, what's the outcome of this experiment? It'll be there, but it just probably won't be detectable at that point. There are in this. Yeah, exactly. It won't be. It is interesting about this experiment is when I started thinking about the implications of this. So, what does it mean that those original two strands of DNA <coughs> are still present in this bacterial population after an infinite number of generations? It's weird, I admit, but the, what I think of is maybe those two original double helices that made me are still in my body somewhere. Maybe they're in my toe, I don't know. Right? Semi-conservative replication. The original strands of DNA that made us, single cell embryo, those two strands don't get broken and reassembled and shot into different parts of our body, different cells. They stay intact. And they stay in us, serving as molecules to replicate more DNA and more DNA and more DNA. It's like a family tree of our DNA. Single cell embryo spawns all the DNA molecules that exist and get synthesized during each round of cell division as we grow and develop. And all organisms, not just us, of course. Dr. Yeah. So I know we talked about the conservative and semi-conservative, and the book also mentioned distributed. Or yeah, that one. is that more kind of based off of like what happens in the meiosis? That theory more so than mm. what's I just like crossing over kind of thing. I opt not to talk about distributed DNA replication for a reason because I don't want to get confused with what happens during recombination in meiosis. And so, if you read, and I hope you did. Just eliminate distributed replication from your brains. It was another alternative hypothesis about the, how DNA replication could occur. But A, Messelson and Stahl didn't test that. Well, this did test that hypothesis. They didn't explicitly test that hypothesis. And yeah, I don't want to get confused with recombination, which 
is, seems related to distributed synthesis. Thank you for pointing that out. So let's see where we're at with DNA polymerase replicates DNA in which polarity? <coughs> Come on. Yep, adds new nucleotides to the three prime end of the growing chain. So if you have, as we saw in PCR, here's a template strand, five prime to three prime. So it's a single stranded molecule of DNA. So if we're going to draw a primer in here, I'll draw it in the middle here just for fun. Which end, the, this is what the question was asking, which end of this molecule does replication proceed in? What's the molecule, or what's the atom at the five prime end of DNA? Think about it, an A nucleotide. Five prime carbons attached to, normally the five prime carbon we've looked at these before is on the top left. There's a phosphate. So there's a five prime phosphate, and the other end, the three prime end of every nucleotide is oxygen, hydroxyl and OH. And we know that this primer is anti-parallel, five prime. There's a phosphate there, and there's three prime. And polymerase starts at the three prime end of the primer and moves to the left. So it's adding nucleotides to the three prime end. of a strand. This, unfortunately, is one of those things you do just have to memorize. As you saw on Friday, you can look things up during the exam, but this is one of those things that if you're going to memorize anything, memorize this. Three prime end is where DNA synthesis occurs. <coughs> And what same, so the second question on the Socrative quiz was exactly the same question. So I bet if you got this one right, you probably got the other one right as well. Which direction does DNA polymerase move? Ooh, interesting. We've got split decision. Let's go back. So is RNA polymerase moving towards the five prime end of the template or the three prime end of the template? Well, it's already drawn up here. Here's the template strand. So if it's adding on to the three prime end and moving this direction, it's moving towards the five prime end of the opposite strand. This is a fact that just comes out of the fact that DNA is anti-parallel. If it's adding nucleotides onto the three prime end of a strand, that means on the opposite strand, it's moving in the five prime direction. So it was just too, I was being unnecessarily tricky. Same, two questions basically asking about the same concept. So, will you always ask whether you want the original, well, in terms of the direction of the original strand, or are you going to ask for the new DNA strand? Either. So, that's the only thing you need to be able to distinguish those two is knowing that DNA is anti parallel. So, if your question yeah. asks um, which way does it grow in terms of the new developing strand, we would still say three prime to five prime? It, DNA polymerase adds nucleotides to the three prime end of a strand. In other words, here's a way to think about this. Here's a double helix, or at least there's a double helix. There's a telomere. There's another telomere. This is overly simplified, but I think it maybe is a good way to answer this question. Label the polarity. You've got four ends of two strands, so you should be able to put two five primes and two three primes on this molecule. Where's, RNA, where's DNA polymerase? If this is a molecule that's being replicated. It's on the top strand, sitting right there, adding nucleotides. So 
polymerase is moving in that direction. If polymerase is there, which prime is that nucleotide that's sitting on top of? It's the three prime end of a growing strand. So that means that we can then fill in the other three polarities. So that's all you need. You only need one piece of information to answer any question about DNA and polymerase and polarity. If you get one of the polarities, one of the three primes or one of the five primes, you can fill in the other three. And I'll talk about the growing strand, the top strand in this case, or the template strand, which is the bottom strand. So on the original template strand, it's moving in the five prime direction. Towards the five prime, or could, you could say away from the three prime. That's the direction polymerase is moving on the bottom. It's always, though, the only thing you have to remember is my point is that it adds to the three prime end of the growing newly synthesized strand. After you know that piece of information, then you can figure out the polarity of all of the other carbons in a double helix. So a prokaryotic chromosome is circular, and there's a point at which, I should draw that as a double helix, two strands anyway. So there's a point where the replication bubble forms, and this is a spot where the two double strands have become denatured, they've melted, they've separated. We've got a double helix. But then there's a small region where, which is called the origin of replication, try remembering that, where replication starts. What sort of a base pair composition, what sort of nucleotides, which bases do you think you find in origins of replication? The only thing you need to know here is that what's just happened? had a double helix, and then part of it did what? Uh, Denatured. So which nucleotides are going to make it easiest for bacterial enzymes to melt part of their genomes? A's and, A's and T's, if it was RNA or A's and U's. So <coughs> origins tend to be, in both prokaryotes and eukaryotes, AT rich. It's an easy way for scientists to figure out where origins of replication might be. They look along a chromosome until they find a sequence that's got a long sequence, these are not usually a short thing, that generally have much more A's and T's than the rest of the chromosome. Those tend to be where chromosomes start to replicate. It's where the enzymes have the easiest time pulling the two strands apart. And of course, you want to separate the two strands because as we learned from Mendelssohn and Stahl, you need single strands to act as templates for synthesizing. Semi conservative replication. So that, that gets at that second point origins of replication, number and base pair composition. Just talk about base pair composition. What about number of origins? Bacteria have one. How many do we have on our chromosomes? One? Do we have more than two? So, quick exercise. Our biggest chromosome, do anybody know which of our chromosomes is the longest chromosome? Chromosome one, by definition, because we've numbered them based on size. 
So human, here's a little exercise for you to do in class. Right now, you can do a partner exercise if you want, share with your neighbor. A few pieces of information first. Here's human chromosome one. It's 247 million base pairs long. And eukaryotes, our DNA polymerases replicate about a thousand nucleotides or base pairs per second. So from there to there, all of our nucleotide, all of our polymerases just synthesize a thousand. That's pretty fast if you think about it. Sticking nucleotides together at a fantastic rate. So even that fast, how long would it take a cell to synthesize chromosome 1? That's the question. So work on that for a couple of minutes, and then we're going to come back together and discuss what your answer is. It was four minutes. Four minutes? Yeah. Eight hours. Well, almost three days. Got a, maybe I should make this the next Socrative quiz. How long is it? No, we want to know now. No, we want to know now. Okay. So if you've got if you've got three billion base pairs or nucleotides, either one, and synthesis occurs at 100 nucleotides per second, that's how many seconds? That's 30 million, right? Am I good so far? Somebody check my math, right? You get rid of two zeros and two zeros, and you're left with 30 million seconds. Oh, did I say 1,000? Yeah. Okay, let's do 1,000. 3 million seconds. Okay. 3 million seconds? No, we said 247. That's yeah, three billion is close enough. Okay, it's not. It's not. That's all. Then we'd be a different species altogether. Okay, okay. Let me ask. Okay, let's take a quick poll then. How many of you got answers in terms of it would take a cell hours? Yeah. As opposed to days. Hours as opposed to days. Okay, days as opposed to months. How many people calculated in like zero to one to twenty-eight days, one to thirty-one days? Okay, anybody over thirty-one days? Okay, so on the order of a month, then we're agreeing. DNA polymerase is damn slow. Oh, wait, no, no. Sorry, what's the opposite? Our chromosomes are too damn long. What does this have to do with the origins of replication? This is why our chromosomes have multiple origins of replication. Because it would take one enzyme, like a month, to synthesize our longest chromosome. So you have to have lots of polymerase molecules at a time working to synthesize each of our chromosomes. But maybe I should step back a second. Why is it such a problem that, who cares if it takes polymerase a month to synthesize a chromosome? Tissue repair. So what has to happen, yeah, it's tissue repair, too. what has to happen, what's waiting in biology that we've already talked about in class, what's waiting for DNA synthesis to happen? What can't happen before synthesis is complete? Cell division. Does it take a month for each of your cells to divide? No. How long did it take you to become a living, free, free living organism? Nine months. Nine months. Nine months. If it takes one month for polymerase to synthesize one chromosome, there would be nine cell divisions, nine months. We'd go from a one cell embryo to like a thousand cell embryo in nine months. Does that sound familiar? Probably not a thousand. No. We know inherently that our cells divide faster than once a month. We would not be the size we are now if we had to wait a month for our cells to divide. So, yes, eukaryotic chromosomes have lots of replication origins. That means our chromosomes, instead of the example I drew of 
a bacterial chromosome. Our chromosomes have multiple replication origins, all at the same time. So here's a linear chromosome with some parts that are melted and, are, and DNA polymerase is synthesizing. So that might be an example of a chromosome. Lots of replication origins, lots of replication bubbles. <coughs> now, I did something here on purpose in that drawing. Does that look, made one bigger. What does that tell us about that replication origin? <coughs> what does it mean if it's bigger? Ah, let me draw in the fact that there is some synthesis going on. So parts of these replication origins are where replication begins. Right, so here are some of the newly synthesized strands. I'm being very simplistic here. We're going to go into a little bit more detail next. That bigger bubble, how much DNA has been synthesized there? More than the smaller bubbles. This is true. I'm not just cartooning this and making this up. When our chromosomes have multiple replication origins, some of them start, some of the regions of our chromosomes start replicating earlier than others do. So if you actually looked at a chromosome during synthesis, you'd see something like this. You'd see big replication bubbles, which means they started replicating earlier. DNA synthesis started earlier in time than ones that maybe just started synthesizing DNA which are going to be smaller if you take a snapshot of a chromosome. They're going to look smaller because they haven't had, the polymerase molecules there haven't had time to synthesize a lot of DNA yet. That's right. <laughs> Replication bubbles eventually run into each other because we know that uh, something else that we haven't talked about yet, but synthesis occurs bidirectionally in both directions from a replication origin. So eventually these bubbles grow and grow and grow and they run into each other. And that's how synthesis is accomplished. You synthesize chromosomes not from one end straight through to the other end, but in short little bits. And then we have to start talking about leading strands, lagging strands, and Okazaki fragments. Or we don't have to, I suppose. <laughs> I have a question. Please do. So because you're supposed to have read all of that, I'm not going to bother going through it in class. We can talk about it next class if you have questions about leading strand, lagging strand, Okazaki fragments. But those are all things that you should have learned in earlier classes. Okay, let's take, let's, to summarize, let's do this. Let's say we have a really short chromosome so that it only has one replication bubble. It's a really short eukaryotic chromosome, not multiple <coughs> origins of replication. So we'll give this a normal polarity. If you want to know about late leading and lagging strands in Okazaki fragments, now is the time to pay attention, even if you've tuned out the whole other thing. We're going to start fresh. There's a double-stranded chromosome at some point during cell, or at some point during DNA synthesis. Double-stranded down here, single-stranded in the middle. What do we know from PCR DNA polymerase needs to initiate DNA synthesis. What are the components that it needs? It needs nucleotides, the individual nucleotides. It needs a DNA polymerase molecule, and it needs 
a single-stranded primer with a free three prime end for it to start adding nucleotides onto. So if we need a three prime end, we're going to have primers on the top strand and the bottom strand. They're going to base pair. So I'm drawing this, by the way. Note the title of this slide, tying up loose ends. Uh, <laughs> these primers, not, this is not PCR now. This is in our cells that this is happening. These primers are not DNA. We have an enzyme in our cells called, in our cells called primase. Guess what they do? They make primers. Primase makes RNA primers. So it's a protein, which I'm going to draw as an oval, that synthesizes those red molecules. That's RNA. So what's the polarity of that RNA molecule? Left side is... Right here, is that five prime or three prime? Right, that's the three prime end of the strand that it's annealed to. So that has to be five prime. It's base paired, so it better be anti-parallel, which means the three prime end is down there. And it's going to be the opposite on the primer for the top strand. Five prime is there. Three prime is there. So now, draw in polymerase. It's a blob. Where am I going to draw it? Three prime ends of both primers. This is how replication starts. Primase synthesizes RNA primers. Polymerase grabs onto the three prime end of the primer, and it starts synthesizing DNA, which I'm going to draw in black. And I'm not going to draw out a specific nucleotide sequence with an arrow pointing in the direction that RNA polymer or DNA polymerase is moving. And the same is true up here at the top. Very first primers, those are the leading strands. Guess what? Those are the first syntheses that start. First primers that are synthesized, the first DNA polymerase molecules that bind and start incorporating nucleotides. Leading strands. So there are two leading strands here. <coughs> the lagging strands are the Okazaki strands, Okazaki fragments. So the big question here is, this does not help us. Sorry, that's not a question. The point is, this does not help us. Because what happens after a long period of time passes there's the top strand, there's the bottom strand, the whole chromosome now, I'm shrinking this down. Here's the position of the original primers and the DNA they just synthesized. So now I'm drawing this after synthesis. How have we screwed up? The other halves are confused. We haven't synthesized bits of the chromosome here and here. If you start with one primer, on each strand that's in the middle of the chromosome and you get leading strand synthesis out towards the ends, you're only going to replicate half of your chromosomes. So what's the solution? The Okazaki fragments? The, yes, the Okazaki fragments are the solution. What's, our, what's primase going to do? We need more primers to initiate more synthesis. So where else in this top picture, the blown up picture, can we add more primers? Right there and right there. Just thinking about one origin. Yes, you can scale this up to multiple origins. But there are other places that you could add primers here. So you get primer there, and you get synthesis. So here on the bottom strand, look, here goes synthesis. And then what happens? Whack. RNA polymerase runs into a double helix, and it stops synthesizing. And the same thing happens on the top strands, looking on the right side, from adding onto the five, three prime end and extending, and then polymerase runs into the five prime end of a currently existing strand of DNA.
So in the big picture, this is what those chromosomes wind up looking like after synthesis is complete, is that in order to synthesize the rest of the chromosomes, you have to have these short little pieces of DNA and lots of primers. So we've got leading strand. That's characterized by a single primer that's extended by a long piece of DNA from the replication of origin. And then the lagging strands are also called Okazaki fragments. Those are short little pieces of DNA, each of which is started by a red <coughs> RNA primer. Is that a whole new enzyme that, that fills in the Okazaki fragments, or is it the right. same? So this is, we're going we're to get back to this at the beginning of next class, the tying up the loose ends part. This does not complete DNA replication. There are a few things left we have to do. So we're going to talk about that at the start of class next time. And for next time, two movies on meiosis. And I'm going to give you more information at the start of next class about completing the comedy genius, if you like, or protocols for doing the current genetics presentations up here at the front of class. We'll get more information about the exam on Wednesday. And we're going to try something new next class as well. Here's the most important thing, though, before you go. I want to know, since we've got all this biotechnology, and we do in vitro fertilization in the world, what can we do to test oocytes for genetic quality? And what do we do? And what I'd like you to do specifically along those lines is take a look at this figure. It's published in the lecture slides. Answer this question down at the bottom. Or, sorry, at the top. What's plotted on the axes? What do the y-axis y -axis and the x-axis in this figure represent? You should be able to figure it out by what's written in the caption. So come to class next time with reading movies and take a look at this figure.